Bluetooth mode. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first uh, webinar in the series of webinars planned from KNA this year. We have uh, planned around eight to nine webinars uh, going forward till uh, uh, our KNA Con, which is uh, to be held uh, next year in 2024 uh, at uh, Tumkur. Uh, I would now in, uh, like to invite uh, our president, Dr. Shiram Krishnaru from Shumaga, to uh, give his opening remark. Sir. So you need to unmute, sir. Am I audible now? Yes, yeah. yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, welcome all the friends. Uh, from this year, we thought we will have a monthly webinar uh, from different places in the Karnataka so that we have an interaction with all the people as well as we can update our knowledge as well. So we plan to have a monthly meeting on every Wednesday between 8 to 9.30 p.m., third Wednesday of every month. So this is the first one we are having today being presented by Bangalore uh, neurologists. So I welcome you all for this program. I request all the members of KNA to make available during this time and attend the program in large numbers so that it will be a stimulus for us to organize and uh, go ahead with the activity. Thank you, sir. So we have uh, four uh, interesting cases uh, from four different uh, institutes. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Shiram Krishna is joined by Dr. Uh, Anita Madhavan from Nimhans uh, as a co-chairman. Uh, I would now request Dr. Anita to start the proceedings uh, with the case from uh, Nimhans. Uh, thank you, sir, and thank you, Dr. Guru. We are really looking forward to this exciting series. And I think it's a refreshing change that uh, normally pathology is the last stop. So it's really nice to be the opening batsman. I would request uh, Dr. Yesha to take over, introduce the speakers, and present the case. A pleasure to invite Dr. Yesha. Hello, good evening, everyone. And uh, without uh, any further delay, I request Dr. Rima, who's our DM resident, to present the case followed by Dr. Rashmi, who will present the electron microscopic features. And I thank the clinician who has provided this case. He is uh, uh, from uh, JIPMA, uh, uh, in a physician from uh, JIPMA. So over to you, Rima. You can start the case. Thank you, ma'am. Is my screen visible? Yes, Rima. Your audible and the screen as well. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening to all. Uh, today, uh, we'll be presenting a case titled Muscle Puzzle in this webinar. And this is about a 50-year-old male who presented with progressive generalized muscle weakness for uh, past six months. And this muscle weakness is insidious in onset and it progressed from proximal to distal. The patient also had a diplopia and deviation of angle of mouth for 45 days and dysphagia for the last 10 days. Uh, he is a known case of HIV on regular treatment for the last 20 years. He had no history of fever or altered bowel habits. Uh, uh, due to the uh, progressive muscle weakness, the patient was evaluated and found to have anti jo one and anti-KU antibodies positive. So he was diagnosed as a case of inflammatory myopathy and started on steroids. In spite of the treatment, the patient had worsening of symptoms and hence uh, further, in spite of the treatment, the patient had worsening of symptoms and hence further uh, investigations were done. Uh, the serum investigations are as follows. The CD4 count of the patient is 94. The HIV viral load is less than 66.9. Uh, the toxoplasma IgG and IgM are negative. Leishmania is negative. 
serum galactomannan is positive and CSF examination is inconclusive for any particular etiology. And the nerve conduction study shows predominant motor neuropathy of both upper and lower limb. Since the serum investigations didn't give a clue about the diagnosis, a muscle MRI was done, which shows a diffuse myositis uh, in bilateral gluteus, quadriceps, femoris, sartorius, gracilis, gastrocnemius, and soleus. So the differentials that were considered in the imaging were a parasitic myositis, an antisynthetase syndrome myositis, and an ART-induced myositis. Finally, a muscle biopsy was planned for this patient and a left vastus lateralis muscle biopsy was done. And in the subsequent slides, we will see what the muscle biopsy shows. So here, the bigger picture which you are seeing here is the muscle biopsy from the patient. And the smaller picture you are seeing at the corner is that of a normal muscle. Here you can see a, a single muscle fascicle within which you can see several myofibers. The nuclei is almost inconspicuous or not visible in this part. Uh, compared, uh, comparing this with that of the patient, you can see though the fascicular architecture is preserved, there are a lot of busyness happening in this biopsy. And another striking feature is uh, you can't see uh, any blue tinge in this normal biopsy. Here that there are a lot of blue cells roaming here and there. So the blue represents the nuclei in the uh, hematoxyl and an eosin stain. And in the arrow indicates few intact muscle fibers which are seen scattered throughout the biopsy. So in this bar, we can make out that something is happening within the muscle. So what it is? We'll move on to the higher power. Here we can see these clusters, aggregates, or we can also call these small masses of these uh, round structures which are clumped together. And uh, if you focus on these structures, and try to look at the surrounding muscle fibers, you can see that the similar structures were also seen within the muscle fibers also. And the interstitium is showing some minimal inflammation composed of lymphocytes and few plasma cells. In, uh, in this picture, you can see a transfer, a longitudinally cut muscle fiber. But uh, this is not a normal muscle fiber. This is a totally distracted muscle fibers. And what is causing the distraction is the uh, within the muscle fiber, there are these large aggregates of these round spore-like structures. This is totally uh, destroying the muscle fiber. And the muscle fiber is also bloated up as you can see in this picture. The another important finding in this picture is these uh, spherical round spore-like structures are in turn divided into tiny compartments by a thin septae. Uh, though it is not clear in this uh, power, we can very well appreciate this thin septae going in between and separating it into tiny compartments. And these are the adjacent muscle fibers showing those similar structures. And uh, this is a higher power to show you the uh, membranes. So here you can see those uh, round to oval spherical spore-like structures resembling infective organisms. And these are surrounded by uh, intense eosinophilic membranes. And these are called, since it is around the spores, enclosing it, these are called as the pansporoblastic vacuoles. And these, this muscle fiber is studded with these panphoroblastic vacuoles. And these vacuoles vary in sizes. And the number of spores within each of these vesicles also vary. Here you can see a muscle fiber. How did we identify that this is a muscle fiber? It's because of the striations which we can see here. And this muscle fiber is almost entirely replaced by a large vacuole which is studded by these spores and this is the highest magnification of the spore to look for uh, to look at the morphology so these spores are oval to some are spherical in shape it ranges from 1 to 4 microns and there is uh, no difference not much of difference in the size as well as the shape of the uh, spores and there is um, 
no budding forms or no hyphal forms identified in this bar. And uh, we went ahead with the uh, special stains. The first stain is the uh, GMS stain. Here we can see the uh, uh, muscle fiber which are studded with these pores. And this is a higher power to show the intense peripheral rim which is seen in the GMS stain. And next is the uh, PAS stain. And here you can see those vesicles, that pansporoblastic uh, vacuoles are uh, uh, distinctly highlighted by this PAS stain. And the more classic feature is seen here. Here you can see a single spore. And at the end of the spore, you can see an intense PAS staining, which is called as the polar granule, which is very characteristic for these organisms. This uh, picture also shows uh, a nice uh, pansporoblastic vacuole. This is also called as sporophorus vesicle. This is the gram stain. And these organisms are gram positive, which is very well seen in this picture. So the histological diagnosis, we uh, uh, so taken into consideration the morphology and the presence of the sporo, uh, uh, sporophorus vesicle and the uh, um, posterior, uh, sorry, uh, the polar granules in the PAS stain. We uh, came, uh, we made a diagnosis of microsporidial myositis in this case. Uh, a few points about microsporidial myositis. It is an unicellular obligate intracellular organism and it ranges from 1 to 4 microns. The microsporidia rarely infect humans uh, unless the subject is immunocompromised. So the most common manifestation in humans, as we all know, it is the diarrhea, which is prevalent in 30 to 40, 70 percent of the uh, HIV patients. So how does the transmission happen. Uh, the microsporidia is ubiquitous in nature. It can be seen in all vertebrates and invertebrates. So unless the host is immunocompromised, there is no chance for disease manifestation. So uh, the infective or the uh, phase is the uh, environmental phase. So the mode of transmission occurs most commonly through the uh, undercooked or uncooked meat through which the uh, spores enter into our body. And from these spores, the sporoblastum is injected into the host cells. And from then, the proliferative phase starts. And then the spores are transformed into merons. And this process is called as the merogony. So merons are formed by binary division or uh, a multiple divisions can also happen, depends on the species. Once the merogony is completed, the merons will accumulate a thick membrane around it and it will enter into the sporogony. And in the sporogony, as the name suggests, spores will be developed. But the stages are from the merozoan, sporoblast will be developed. And from the sporoblast, multiple spores will be developed. And this thick membrane, which we can see around, is what we are seeing in the HNE as the uh, pansporoblastic membrane around these spores. And uh, here you can see the disease spectrum. The microsporidia can cause in immunocompromised individuals. Uh, though there are more than 1,500 species identified in microsporidia, some of the species have a common site of infection. For example, if you take the encephalitozoan, it is common in the small intestine, and these uh, and the patients can present with diarrhea, intestinal perforation, cholangitis, and nephritis. Similarly, there are few species which are specific for muscle. For example, Leptospora, which is common site of infection, is in the muscle, and the disease manifestation is the myositis. And there are other species such as Trachypleptospora and Anacillea algerae. So these are the species which are which have a um, which have an affinity towards the muscle. 
so the uh, 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 we also should know about the other infectious organism which can cause myositis in hiv patient as we uh, saw the microsporidia in this case there is a trichinella species also which can cause trichinosis but in the histology we can see the larval forms encysted within the muscle and that's how we will differentiate and a toxoplasma gondii though there is a um, size uh, overlap between these organisms and microsporidia they use the bradyzoites will usually form encysted uh, structures within the muscle fibers and there will be absence of pan sporocytophorous vacuoles as well as the pronal granule which we saw in the pas state the other close dd is a histoplasma Though the press, uh, pre, uh, though histoplasma causing myositis is very rare in case of HIV patient, and uh, by histology we can differentiate it by usually the histoplasma will be seen within the macrophages as we can see it here, and there will be budding yeast forms uh, as well as the absence of the vacuoles as well as the polar granule. The candida, which again cause myositis, though rare in HIV patients, usually have a dense neutrophilic tissue response, and you can see the fungal uh, yeast forms as well as the pseudo hyphae. Uh, so these are the other uh, infectious organisms which can cause myositis in HIV patient. So uh, there are five important microsporidium genera that will cause myositis. The first one is the Platysphora. The second one is the Trachyplatysphora, uh, uh, followed by Brachiola vesicularum, Ancalia algieriae, and tu uh, Tubulinosima. So among these, the top two are the most commonly reported or uh, microsporidial organisms responsible for myositis. When we hear the word microsporidia, our mind always links it to the intestine. So we have to remember that it is not always a gut feeling and the microsporidia can also cause infections in other organs. So the histological clues will, which helped us to clinch the diagnosis in this case is the groups of clusters of spores surrounded by the pansporoblastic membranes, which we saw in the HND stain and the polar granules in the PAS stain. And... Um, one should always keep in mind that when we see uh, the when uh, we encounter an ovoid and refractile spores of one to four microns within the myofibers in an immunocompromised patient, we should raise a suspicion of microsporidiasis. The histological examination is crucial in coming to the in making a diagnosis of microsporidia especially in a uh, place where it is resource limited and electron microscopic findings are not available. However, the confirmation and the species uh, identification will be done by the electron microscopy. Now, um, I'll hand it over to Dr. Reshmi to discuss the electron microscopic findings. Thank you, Dr. Rima. Uh, you've already solved half the puzzle. So let's look at what electron microscopy has to give us. So basically, when we look for a microsporidium under electron microscope, we need to look for these features. One is to look for the number of coils of the polar tubules, the number of nuclei, size, shape, the features of their developmental life cycle, and the presence of the sporophorous vesicle. So on your right, you can see this is a diagram of the internal structure of the microsporidium. So electron microscopy can help you look at the internal structures or the subcellular structures of a given sample. So this is the uh, diagram of the internal structure, wherein this is the posterior end, and, and sorry, this is the anterior end, and this is the posterior end. Uh, the spore is covered by a very electron-dense, thick exospore, followed by an electron-loosened endospore, and then the plasma membrane. Internal structures consist of the lamellar polaroplast, the tubular polaroplast, the polar tubule, which is also in the coil form, and the nucleus. This picture is showing a binucleate structure, and there is the presence of this polar vacuoles. In addition, they also have the ribosomes, which are intensely, they are supercoiled, and they're present within the matrix or the sporoplasm. So let's look into the features that we saw. 
Uh, basically, when we process sample for electron microscopy, they are finally embedded in a resin. Uh, so this is a resin section that is stained with toluidin blue stain. What we are seeing is portion of the muscle, wherein you are seeing this is one muscle fiber, this is another muscle fiber, and surrounding that are few blood vessels. So if we focus on these, you can see that there are plenty of spore, uh, spores within the sarcoplasm of the muscle fiber. So on the right picture shows that there are plenty of these sporophorous vesicles which contain numerous spores within them. So there are spores also that were seen in the interstitium. Now let's go into the ultrastructures. So what did we see? We saw that there are spores within the sporophorous vacuoles sporophorous vesicles and this is how it appears on electron microscopy. This is just the image of single muscle fiber which has numerous pores in them. So uh, the next what we are seeing here is I'm trying to show the sporophorous vesicle that is indicated by the arrow. So this is numerous pores within the muscle fiber which has which are in uh, various stages of the development. Again, another image to show the numerous pores. Now, as I told, the initially I had shown you the uh, diagram. So we can see that the exospore, which is slightly wavy, and it is also called rugos, and which is one of the characteristic feature of a tracheostophora species. Now we can also see these polaroplasts. We can see the ribosomes tightly coiled, and these are the polar tubules. So we can also see the nucleus. Now to concentrate, as I clearly told, we should see at the nucleus, the number of polar tubules, the shape, the size. So let's look at these features. The size of these pores were around 2.5 to 3 mu meters in the, uh, on the long axis. And on the short axis, it was around 2 mu meters. So, and each of these pores had, these are the polar tubules. The arrangement of these polar tubules is anisophilar, which means that there are two diameters of the polar tubules. You have the larger diameter polar tubules and the posterior tubules are of smaller diameter, which vary in number between uh, seven to nine. So on the right, we can see the similar picture. So to cut short the story, we have to see now what are the species that had a uninuclei or a binucleate. So when initially Dr. Rima shared that which are the species that could cause myositis, there were four to five species. And of that, the brachiola species and tubulinosema species, they are diplocaryotic. And therefore, we can easily rule out them. And the consideration now will be between the tracheosphora, tracheospora and the uh, pleostospora species. And we can see that they both of them show an uninucleate structure. And the size was almost similar to what we uh, expect to see. And the number of spores is one of the feature under Trachypleostospora, the number of spores will be more in the sporophorous vesicles compared to the Pleostophora species. And we did see that on the lower magnification that there were plenty of spores. So if we uh, look at this life cycle once again, there are Three phases, the proliferative phase and the sporogenic phase is the one that actually happens within the host cell. And when we look at the sporogenic phase where it actually divides and differentiates, so we see that in the sporogenic phase, the Pleostophora species, they have multiple binary divisions and they form within a single sporous vesicle, at least multiple uh, sporons are seen. Whereas in case of Trachypleostospora species, there will be single binary division and there will be each of this division re uh, results in formation of individual spores. So in this, keeping all this in mind, we come to a conclusion that based on the number of polar tubes, it's around 7 to 12 and they were in a row arrangement of seven tubules and the posterior tubules, one to two tubules. And they were all uninucleate tubules, and the size of the mature spore also falls into the range of what we see in Trachypleostospora species. And there were plenty of spores within a sporophorous vesicle. So, 
obviously the ultrastructural findings they confirm that it is a microsporidial infection and we favor the trachypleostospora humnus infection in this particular case thank you thank you dr reema and uh, dr rashmi for that uh, very nice presentation particularly the electron microscopy features in such great detail and uh, i just want to end with a couple of sentences that uh, um, it I, I think all of us are aware that microsporidial myositis is uh, one of the uh, causes of infective myositis in hiv but when we first this is a very recent case that we had and i thank dr uh, uh, from uh, one second I'll... Dr. Jaichandran, Dr. Jaichandran from JIPMA from providing this case. We just reported it last week. But in uh, the first case that we saw at NIMHANS, uh, I'm afraid we, as pathologists, we made a mistake and called it as candida because it was HIV and the patient had candidiasis. And uh, subsequently, we reported a short series of five cases uh, from uh, with uh, Dr. Patel. And uh, I just want to bring this to the awareness that microsporidial is the one that is most common rather than the others. And they respond well to albendazole. But if left untreated, then they can do badly. So that is the teaching point from this uh, takeaway lesson from this uh, case presentation. Thank you. Questions on the chat. Let me ask a question on uh, a very good presentation. I think the opening batsman have used uh, power play very well. Uh, very nice presentation, very uh, uh, interesting case. Uh, how is it uh, differently they behave? In what stage of uh, HIV infection do they uh, uh, present? Is there any particular uh, you know, CD4 count where they present or it can be any stage? Uh... Uh, the CD4 count less than 100. Okay. And, and uh, any particular pattern in terms of myositis uh, where you suspect clinically this could be a possibility? I was just uh, uh, just going back and looking at our previous paper. The the other cases were from uh, Pune, and only one case was from here. And they have uh, presented it as proximal muscle weakness. So I think elevated CPK pain; those are the features. There are no specific uh, findings to indicate that it's uh, parasitic, except that CD4 count is low, CPK is elevated. And it's an immunocompromised patient. Okay. And usually on hist histology, uh, because sometimes the pathologist may not be entirely aware of this, so you can uh, push them, nudge them towards that. Uh, some of our uh, previous cases had neutrophils and eosinophils. This particular one is more chronic and has more of lymphocytes and plasma cells. And uh, this particular case was just loaded with a lot of uh, spores in this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, if I can pitch in, hello. Yeah, hello. yeah, yeah. Uh, see, I think from this case, what we can know is, see, even though clinically it suggests you have inflammatory myositis in retroviral patient, I think we should do a muscle biopsy, not to just do the antibodies and find out if some JO1 or some any of these antibodies are positive. It could be a false positive. Definitely, we have to look for. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, immune uh, this uh, <clears throat> opportunistic infections, I think. So not just doing a muscle. See, right now we are choosing uh, going away from muscle biopsy in many of the myositis. So now I think in the inflammatory myopathy, like picture in immunocompromised, I think biopsy may be mandatory. And uh, that's what I can gather from this because patient didn't respond to treatment. Oh, oh Yes, Dr. Nadik, thank you for highlighting that point. Yes. I think once you're aware of this, you will not miss it. Yeah, that's true, madam. That's what. But that is because joint and positive would have given yes. steroid. Then, then we thought steroid myopathy and then yeah. Yeah. EMG and then our whole thought process will go in a different way. And because uh -huh. the patients will be on antiretroviral medications and then butovidine or anything that yeah. can also cause uh, mitochondrial dysfunction and myopathy. So we would have gone drug reduction, so many other uh, things. I think we should have no index and... Uh, Think for a biopsy in a immunocompromised uh, patient. That's what this yeah. case highlights. Yeah. And also selection of the appropriate muscle too would help. Yeah. It. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you.
So thank you, uh, Team Unimans. Uh, we will uh, move on to the second case uh, uh, from uh, St. John's. Now I'd request uh, Dr. Shuram Krishna to introduce uh, the speaker, the presenter. And the next topic is by Dr. Sucharita, postgraduate from St. John's Medical College. She's going to talk, present to us the confused myelin. Let us see what. Uh, can I start, sir? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. Today I'll be uh, talking about a case termed confused myelin. This is a story of a 21-year-old lady who is nine months postpartum, presented with her, who is a homemaker, hailing from Davangere, who presented with history of fever since 15 days, headache since 15 days, unsteadiness since seven days, blurring of vision in both the eyes since five days. Coming to the presenting complaints, she presented with fever since 15 days, which was present daily, lasting for three to four hours, two to three spikes per day, which was high grade, associated with chills, subsiding with medications for a few hours, but never touched the baseline. There was no history suggestive of URTI, LRTI, or UTI, or vaginal discharge, or rashes, or arthralgia. At the same time, she developed headache, which was continuous, throbbing, holocranial, associated with photophobia, which was moderate to severe in intensity, affecting her daily activities. It was associated with nausea and multiple episodes of vomiting. There was no history suggestive of postural variation of the headache. Seven days into the illness, seven days later, she developed swaying to either side which was not associated with vertigo, loss of sensation or dysarthria with no variation, diurnal variation of the unsteadiness. Four days later, she developed blurring and double vision of both the eyes, right more than the left, which was sudden in onset and it has been progressive. Diplopia was binocular for distant objects with the images side by side. There was history of right periorbital pain one day prior to the onset of visual symptoms. There was no history suggestive of color, uh, color desaturation. There was no history of facial deviation, swallowing difficulty, nasal regurgitation. No history of weakness of any limbs, paresthesia, bowel and bladder symptoms. No history of smearing of food or dysarthria. No history of excessive sleepiness, altered sensorium, history suggestive of seizures, or no history of joint pain, rashes, dry eyes, dry mouth was noted. There was no weight loss. There's no history of loose tools, recent travel, or drug bite. Summarizing the history with whatever we have till now. It's a young female who presented with subacute onset fever, with headache, blurring of vision, diplopia, and unsteadiness that has been progressive till now. The differential at this level that we consider was subacute meningitis, which could be of infective as well as non-infective etiology. Infective, it could be partially treated bacterial meningitis, viral or tubercular or fungal. And non-infective, it could be an inflammatory disorder like sarcoidosis or vasculitis and SLE. The other differential could have been cerebellitis. Now, going back and reviewing her past history, which was significant, three months ago, she had history of acute urinary retention with no history of girdle-like sensation, no history of back pain, or no history of weakness of both the lower limbs. She was diagnosed to have myelitis and she received intravenous steroids followed by oral steroids. Complete resolution of symptoms was noted by one week and she was on tapering dose of steroids for the next two months. But 20 days before the onset of the second episode of illness, she stopped all these medications. Her personal history revealed ap decreased appetite with normal bowel and bladder uh, habits with no history of smoking, alcohol consumption or high risk behavior. Her menstrual history was regular. Currently, she was lactating and she had lactational amenorrhea. There was no history of abortions in the past. Reviewing the history after the past history. So it's a subacute onset meningitis on a background of steroid responsive myelitis that was probably a demyelinating event. The differential is what we would consider along with neuroinfection, systemic autoimmune disorder and inflammatory disorder, a high possibility of relapse of demyelination is considered. We reviewed her old previous investigation records, which showed that she had an, the laboratory investigations in that she had anemia, but the typing of anemia was not known. And a CSF analysis was done, which revealed CSF pleocytosis, which was mostly like lymphocyte dominant. An abdominal pelvic scan was done, which revealed a post-void volume residue of 500 ml. 
MRI spine was done in the previous admission that was three months ago, which showed that there was a T2 flare hyperintensity that was noted in, from in the, it was a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis that was noted from the C2 to the C5 region spanning almost the three vertebral segments. And there was no post contrast enhancement that was noted. On the axial section, we were able to see a H sign. MRI brain was done. MRI brain revealed bilateral T2 flare hyperintensity in the ventrolateral thalamus and the internal capsules as well as bilateral claustrum, but it was asymmetric on the right or more on the right than as compared to the left, but there was no post contrast enhancement that was noted. There was also evidence of uh, subcortical gray matter involvement, subcortical involvement in uh, that was asymmetric, more on the right frontal than the left frontal. Brainstem was not involved. The, our thought process at this time was she had this, the history what she presented was suggestive of subacute meningitis with the background of demyelinating like event. Considering the MRI findings and the spine or uh, MRI spine findings, it was more like mock or Adam like presentation. The odd feature was there was involvement of the cervical spine region in mock with the head side, but the conus was spared. But whereas in mock like presentation, it is the conus that is most commonly involved. But the MRI feature the fluffy the fluffy uh, subcortical uh, white matter hyperintensities is more like mog like presentation the gen coming to the general physical examination with this uh, a young female who is moderately built and nourished, conscious, cooperative, oriented to time, place and person with no pallor, itris, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy and edema. There were no, no rashes, swelling, joint pains or ulcers and vitals were stable. Her temperature was 98.6 Fahrenheit at the time of admission. On CNS examination, her higher mental functions were normal. Right eye pupillary uh, RAPD was present. Visual acuity was decreased. Uh, she was able to count fingers only at three meters in both the eyes. Color vision was impaired. Fundus examination was normal. Right lateral gaze palsy was seen. Convergence was impaired. Gaze evoked nystagmus was seen. Rest of the cranial nerve examination was normal. Motor system examination was normal. Reflexes were brisk with, uh, plant, with plantar being a uh, withdrawal on the right and left side it was flexor. On sensory examination, pain, touch, temperature, joint position, sense and vibration was normal. Cerebellar signs, finger nose test and heel shin test were impaired bilaterally, left more than the right and gait was broad based ataxic gait. There was mild terminal neck stiffness that was present with no abnormal movements. The rest of the other system examination was normal. Deficits at the end of the examinations was right eye RAPD that could have been localized to the right anterior visual pathway, diminished visual acuity and color vision localizing to the optic nerve, right lateral gaze palsy localizing to pons, brisk reflexes could suggest involvement of the corticospinal tracts, impaired finger nose test and heel shin test and ataxic gates localizing to the cerebellum and its connection and terminal neck stiffness uh, uh, showing the involvement of the meninges. After examination uh, and with the findings of the examination, we have the differentials that were still considered for neuroinfection, demyelination and inflammatory etiology. Demyelination was on top of the list because the localization was multifocal in this patient. Coming to the course of the course in the hospital, patient was empirically started on antibiotics and steroids after sending the routine blood investigations and MRI brain with contrast was advised. On the same day, we obtained the laboratory investigations. Her hemoglobin was normal. Total counts, ESR and CRP was normal. LFT, RFT and urine routine was normal. MRI brain was done. MRI brain revealed T2 flare hyperintensities in the dorsal pons as well as in the medulla. And there was involvement of the hypothalamus, the medial temporal region. Hypothalamus, corpus callosum was involved. Dorsal brainstem was involved. And there was increase on new, new fluffy infiltrates that we could see, which was asymmetric in the left higher parietal region with no post-contrast enhancement. MRI spine was not done due to financial constraints. Considering the history, examination, and MRI features, diagnosis of demyelination was most uh, was kept on the top priority. And 
probable NMOSD versus MOG was considered. Further workup was done to evaluate the cause of demyelination. On day one, after starting steroids, there was significant improvement of 50 to 60% in terms of reduction of headache, diplopia, blurring of vision, and vomiting episodes. No spike of fever was noted after the first day of admission. Total counts ESR, CRP was normal. So on the second day, we did a CSF analysis to rule out neuroinfection. So, so here we found that she had CSF pleocytosis, but gram stain, malignant cells, and encephalitis panel was negative. HIV, HBSAG, VDRL was negative. ANA immunoline was negative. ACE levels were normal. This is the report of her meningoencephalitis panel. The same day VEP was done, which showed prolonged P100 latencies of 137 on the right and 138 on the left. We also sent serum uh, NMO mock that turned out to be negative. Her symptom, symptoms had improved by 90% at the end of the second day. CSF study was not suggestive of neuroinfection, hence antibiotics and antivirals were stopped. The possibilities after the second day, what we considered was demyelination. That was NMO versus MOG versus aggressive MS. As serum NMO was negative and there was evidence of dissemination in space and time, aggressive MS was also considered. Inflammatory lesions like sarcoidosis was low on the list because it was no, not enhancing lesions and AC levels were normal. So on the third day, we sent oligoclonal bands, which was normal, which was negative. And uh, we also sent CSF, NMO, and MOG that turned out to be negative. So at the end, what is the diagnosis? So it is a relapsing demyelinating disease, which is steroid responsive. But what is the cause for this demyelination? So the differentials for relapsing demyelinating disease could have been NMOSD, MOGAD, or sarcoidosis. But sarcoid I was ruled out because there was no contrast enhancement and AC levels were normal. Lymphoma. No, it, though it, is, it could have been possible, but because it is steroid responsive, but there is no diffusion restriction and um, on the diffusion weighted sequence and malignant cells were negative on CSF. So the possibilities were NMOSD and MOGAD. So diagnosis, clinically our patient had an episode of acute myelitis followed by bilateral retrobulbar optic neuritis, area post and acute brain syndrome which was steroid responsive. MRI spine has LETM in cervical region with H sign, suggestive of MOGAD. But the odd feature is there is no conus involvement. It is the cervical involvement that is present. MRI brain has few features suggestive of MOG, like the parietal, uh, parietal lesions that are present and few features of NMOST that are periventricular and hypothalamic involvement. However, both serum as well as CSF was negative for both NMO and MOG. So we reviewed the literature. So the diagnostic criteria for zero negative aquaporin NMOST disorder or unknown aquaporin status was reviewed. So our patient uh, fits into this criteria. That's the zero negative aquaporin NMOST. She, uh, in this, at least one core uh, characteristic should be present, con uh, consisting of optic neuritis, LETM, or uh, it has to be an area post syndrome. Our patient had LETM, our patient had retrobulbar optic neuritis, our patient had acute brainstem syndrome also. And MRI findings were also consistent with it. So coming to the treatment, what, what was the treatment that was given? She received inject, injection methylprednisolone 1 gram per day for 5 days, followed by oral steroids at 1 gram per kg, uh, 1 mg per kg for uh, per day. There was 90 to 95% improvement in her symptoms. So what are we going to do next? close follow-up and to watch for relapse episodes and plan on immunomodulation. So what was confusing about this patient was that she uh, presented with features suggestive of meningitis, uh, but, I, but it was a true relapse that she had, true relapse of demyelination that she had. This is an article from the Frontiers of Immunology, immuno, immunoneurology, where there is an aqua 4 positive neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders with meningoencephalitic uh, like onset. That was a case report that was published. In this, the presence of aseptic meningitis combined with clinical symptoms such as optic neuritis, myelitis should raise the possibility of NMOST diagnosis. So the take-home message from this is no clinical or 
radiological feature can conclusively differentiate between aquaporin 4 NMOST versus MUCAD. Close follow-up of such patients is required and aggressive treatment to prevent relapse is recommended. To consider NMOST in patients presenting with fever and intractable vomiting, headache, and with CSF uh, pleocytosis is essential. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Hello. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Ah. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you for the nice case. Any questions? Uh, the case permits, I would like to add. Uh, so here the question was the NMO antibody for persistence uh, means it is low. So probable reasons what we thought was this patient had received steroids beforehand uh, during the first episode. So once some patients receive steroids, I don't know how much uh, it can come positive. If Dr. Anita can pitch in and they can report it. So this, even if we did CSF, that also has come negative. So is there any role of doing CSF uh, antibodies if the serum has come negative, especially in NMO and MO? Is my one uh, question. The other thing is uh, whether it is true NMOSD because these are all overlap syndromes. We really don't know. Is there any other antibodies like uh, uh, glial fibrillary? We don't have that, but that's not a classical findings, I think. But the treatment will be same, steroid close follow-up and consider uh, immunomodulation. I think she didn't mention, we thought we'll give her uh, uh, rituximab in this patient that it is more like an MOSD and then we have started it and then we should follow up. Dr. Raghu, um, in fact, even I wanted to ask what is the time of testing? Because like you said, if prior immunomodulation has been given, you can get a false negative mode. Maybe that's what has happened in this case. Yeah, that, okay. that's what we also thought, ma'am. So another take-home message is that I think when we all see, uh, it is better we take one sample and in all yes. demyelinating disease, whether it may be a classical MS also, these are the biomarkers we have. We should send a sample so wow. that it will help us in guidelines. So there are sometimes more can be falsely positive in MS patient. That is also there. Correct. But the one should uh, be aware that if you don't do it, then next subsequent follow-ups and we'll, because I don't know whether this patient will ever come positive now, but the clinical picture and she has got two episodes. This was more catastrophic for her. So we, we don't have any options of withdrawing her treatment for next few uh, years. I think at least for two years. So that is one more message is that as a physicians, we should be have low threshold to send uh, NMO antibodies uh, in these type of disorders. Yeah, absolutely right. A uh, lot of literature is there with plasma ferrisis and mm -hmm. IVIG making the mock completely disappear. I couldn't find any um, literature which tells you how much of steroid if you gave does it disappear. That I don't know. But I think this is a case in point where it has become negative or it's truly a zero negative is now very, very difficult to say. Question on whether CSF is to be done? Uh, answer is no, because zero, it's an ex, it's a, it's not intrathecal production. No? Yes. So you don't expect CSF to be positive. You would want the serum to show. So it's not going to help. But in the next, if she has an acute episode, peak of episode, maybe you can uh, that's what ma'am. This was the peak of the episode when she had come. So we had actually first sent the serum, which came negative, then we sent the CSR. So this time she had presented, I think, first day we gave only dexamethasone with antibiotics. We are strongly thinking of uh, neuro infection. So then the second day onwards, we started our own uh, methylprednisolone. Uh, once the CSF was not suggestive of uh, neuro infection, and she made a dramatic recovery within uh, 24 hours. She was photophobic, restless, and next day she was walking. So that is a dramatic response. Yeah. Interval. Yeah, imaging. Initiated yeah. steroid sorry, sorry. sorry, Sharath. Next I think Dr. Sharath is there. I think he has also seen the images. So there uh, are imaging is, sir. Imaging is very, very classical of uh, MOGAD there because uh, it's not mandatory that always CONUS should be involved in all MOGAD cases. It can mimic, it can involve any part, though CONUS is considered as one of the characteristic imaging findings. But the H shaped uh, central gray hyperint in city and ADM like mimicker. It, it was uh, ADM like picture on imaging 
with the lithium and a central gray matter involvement no t2 bright spotty sign no enhancement all favors more towards uh, mogad so i would have reported as probably zero negative mogad uh, as a first differential diagnosis or adm that's it imaging is very very fitting to mogad so ragu interval between steroid initiation and uh, testing is actually some steroids was given 3 months back methylphenidate and sugar and oral steroids so on the tapering because they had improved and they had stopped before the this so it was almost you would have taken about 8 uh, uh, weeks of steroids then it could still be a false yeah And the other thing, if Dr. Sharad, we can mention that uh, uh, retroval, it was more of a retroval of neuritis, and then the hypothalamic mm. involvement with uh, high fever. So, mm. and so that was which see that's what overlap of MOGAD and MO. So that's mm. a, so it is so it's 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 a gray line. What is it really MOGAD or really MO is the question because the mm. antibodies are negative in this patient. Okay. Okay. Uh. can i now ask dr raja to uh, you know ask a, a question or make a comment he had raised his hand uh, host can you uh, uh, unmute uh, dr raja so go ahead sir can you uh, unmute and ask the question sir or make a comment dr raja i don't think uh... okay okay so then we will uh, you know get on with the next case uh, i now i invite uh, uh, dr shabrish uh, from ramaya medical college for his presentation can i can i have the introduction slide please senator you can uh, yes sir uh, stop sharing thank you yeah uh, dr shabrish is uh, associate professor department of neurosurgery at ramaya medical college hospital so he will be uh, uh, presenting a case of uh, hemispherotomy clinician's conundrum what to you dr shabrish uh, uh, thank you for the introduction sir is my uh, screen visible yes yes please go ahead yeah uh, so good evening to one and all so I've chosen this um, topic which is very close to my heart uh, then pretty uh, common um, epilepsy surgical procedure uh, with the decades of history and it is still evolving this particular field but then when a child or an adult especially uh, presents with the hemispheric epilepsy we all go through this conundrum you know whether we can actually do the hemispherotomy or not so what are the possible dilemma that one would uh, come across and how we can you know uh, face it and then help the patient to have a seizure free life and this surgery i've chosen because this is considered as one of the crown jewel of epilepsy surgery with the complexity of the techniques as well and then the amazing uh, seizure freedom rate that can be achieved with this particular uh, technique but uh, with the mixture of um, you know history of bad uh, outcome functional outcomes this technique is not really uh, sought out for and most most of the time it becomes a last resort uh, for the hemispheric epilepsy so yeah uh, this is the outline of my talk today uh, through a case unit i would like to uh, highlight the surgical safety um, of the procedure and then of course the seizure outcome and the uh, functional uh, outcome of the procedure so today uh, i'll be presenting a case of 2.2 uh, and a half year old uh, child with focal drug refractory epilepsy 
uh, one of the patients referred from Dr. Ryan. Uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Ryan is online. Um, I, I guess she's traveling. So I'll be uh, covering the clinical details and I guess VDG as well. So she's a two and a half year old child, boy. Um, focal been presented to us with focal symptomatic epilepsy with the onset around three to four weeks of life, very early onset of um, epilepsy with uh, birth history, just, of, just about having maternal PIH and uh, having been delivered through a cesarean section. Um, highlighting uh, features that with a large head circumference of 34 centimeter. I guess that would uh, give, a, give you all a clue as to what this diagnosis is going to be. So child, when child presented to us, there was a global de uh, developmental delay and is able to walk with um, you know, two hand support from 18 months onwards. And yeah, and the handedness was, uh, sorry, this is right side hand and hand handedness because the left side there was hemiparesis already. And there were no meaningful words yet. So uh, semiology of the uh, seizure, so this is the uh, home um, a capture video at home where you can see the head and eye deviation to the left, trunk crouch with the noisy breathing and left upper and uh, lower limb uh, tonic uh, posturing and the tonic cloning uh, twitches which progress uh, to go on to develop uh, GTCS. I mean, the reason why we actually showing this habitual seizure is we couldn't really capture this uh, seizure during the video EG when we had some minor events with the electrography uh, correlates. So this was the uh, semiology at presentation. And this slide gives you a, a overall temporal profile of the uh, evolution of the epilepsy in this child. It started with just two drugs and very early onset, as I said earlier, with five events in the first two, you know, first three to four weeks of life. Then progressively, progressively uh, you know, uh, drugs were added. And when the child presented to us, Child was on already on four antiepileptics with the EG feature still uh, showing ongoing uh, continuous spike in wave discharges, and hence steroids were started by Dr. Ann. So, this is definitely a proven case of uh, drug refractory epilepsy, considering the definitions of two years and multiple drugs. So, on examination, there were no major uh, neurocutaneous stigmata seen. Uh, with uh, no dysmorphism except for the skull asymmetry, where the right side was uh, bigger than the left. So, and other, other than that, on examination, obviously there is a small left eye isotropia, uh, and then there is obvious left hemiparesis with uh, around grade three. The best power that we could see was grade three weakness with significant hand weakness on the left side. Child also had dystonic movements and other uh, upper motor neuron signs. So this is the video EG. Uh, I'm not sure Dr. Ann is online. Okay, uh, this is basically the- uh, I'm, on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm here. Uh, yeah, madam, yeah. So this is the uh, interactical, uh, interactive record. Madam, you want to uh, comment on that? Interactive, this is the this first is, one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, this is interactive. I'll just ask through the uh, pages. Yeah. Yeah, the, there's increasing fast activity on one side, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. on the, on the right hemisphere, we have- Yeah, right hemisphere, we have. Yeah. And it is because, it's beating have... more. It's increasingly yeah. building up, isn't it? As And we yeah. had to reduce the drugs. And, and then we got yeah. this. And... Yeah, this, these are all interictal uh, discharges from the right hemisphere. I'll just go to the- And, uh, and there is event. asymmetry. There is background asymmetry as yeah, well. And, yeah. As you can see with yeah. the yeah. uh, change in frequency as well. Yeah. Of the, so this is the first event. You can see that mild movement that, that happened on the left upper limb and lower limb. Child were on uh, steroids and then multiple antiepileptics. What we can see is that right hemisphere classical uh, spike discharges from the mostly from the frontal and the uh, parasitical leads, but entirely right hemispheric. So the left hemisphere was uh, clean, uh, clean. And this is another event. Again, uh, the left upper limb jerks. Again, showing right hemispheric uh, discharges, mostly frontal and uh, parasitical leads. Yeah. That's it. 
So these are all the uh, video EG findings. Unfortunately, we couldn't record the habitual seizures. And this is the uh, MRI. So as you all can see, it's very obvious feature suggestive of the right hemimegalencephaly, where you can see the extensive dysplastic hemisphere with, uh, with a lot of subcortical heterotopias and with a lot of uh, periventricular gliosis. And you can see here, that is a very a bad feature with a hypertrophic septum pellucidum, which is significantly, um, you know, which poses difficulties during the surgeries where we had to enter the ventricles to disconnect the hemisphere. This again, the uh, sagittal view of the same flare MRI, where you all can see the entire hemisphere is abnormal. With a particle heterotopias and significant uh, dysplastic features in the cortex with salsa and chiral abnormalities. So, uh, considering the uh, AEC hypothesis of our workhorse, uh, entire uh, clinical radiological pictures and electrophysiological uh, features were suggestive of right hemispheric uh, pathology. So, and since the entire hemisphere were involved, we decided for uh, right hemispherotomy. So the uh, pre-op evaluation was normal except for hypothyroidism for which uh, child was already on three placements. And the significant feature that I would like to highlight is that we did subject this child for a pre-operative rehabilitation, the popular pre-rehab uh, strategy for almost six months before the surgery. So the surgery which uh, we performed was the right vert vertical parasitical hemispherotomy using the hinterhemispheric approach. Uh, so the reason why I'm highlighting is that there are many centers still following the uh, perisylvian uh, technique of hemispherotomy, which is equally uh, efficient and with the good outcomes. So we followed this particular technique. And that is the post-operative CT. And one can see in the axials, the clear anterior disconnection and the middle disconnection. And of course, the posterior disconnections. Broadly, uh, three steps of the surgery and for the completion, one can see that uh, disconnection line in the uh, middle disconnection extending from the lateral ventricle, body of the lateral ventricle, extending down to the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle, which indicates a complete uh, disconnection. And then, of course, the major part of the surgery would be the uh, total callosotomy from anterior to posterior, extending from the genium to uh, splenium, which is very significant to avoid recurrence of uh, seizures in hemispherotomies. So um, as the first step, I failed to, um, I mean, I forgot to mention that we did take biopsy wherever uh, we did the exposure for the, in, during the interhemispheric approach where the superior frontal gyrus was excised and sent for biopsy. So that came as actually the reactive astrocytosis with gliosis. There was no dis, uh, features of cortical dysplasia. Maybe the, uh, the sample... Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so obviously the the sam the uh, site was not representative probably, but maybe if we had gone anterior or posterior, probably would have uh, got the cortical dysplasia as the biopsy result. And the major uh, highlight that I would, would like you all to notice is the an amazing improvement in the left uh, upper and lower limb uh, movements within two months of the uh, surgery. A child is definitely seizure-free. I mean, it's too early to comment on the seizure freedom. The minimum uh, uh, time period that we would usually use is at least two years. But then with two months of follow-up, the functional outcome with, with complete um, a disconnection is, is what I would want to highlight for today's uh, presentation. So that's about the seizure freedom and the functional outcome of this particular child. So... Coming to the uh, second part of the uh, talk as to how and what are the techniques that have come to enhance the existing surgical safety. Today, we do use uh, navigation and, and a very sophisticated microscope to uh, you know, do the uh, vertical hemispherotomies. But then we one step ahead, we can use endoscopic uh, assisted techniques to do the same hemispherotomy with a much smaller craniotomy and much smaller exposure. And this is the paper which we published uh, giving the seizure freedom rates and functional outcome rates. 
So, and one step uh, ahead is the bloodless technique, which we recently published in Janus Pediatrics, where thermocoagulation was used. Of course, it was robotic assisted thermocoagulation, where it has come. This is uh, what do you say? It's a complete bloodless technique because obviously the middle disconnection, which goes through the basal ganglia, is one of the most vascular uh, step of the surgery. And the entire surgery that I did now with the vertical hemispherotomy, which went on for around six and a half to seven hours of surgery. Obviously, we do uh, you know, replace the blood and all that. But then, if possible, if the um, you know the patient's uh, brain anatomy is supportive, one can definitely use this uh, advanced technique of thermocoagulative uh, hemispherotomy. Of course, these are all the infrastructure-driven uh, techniques. So, nevertheless. I guess one would, if one would want to uh, improve their uh, seizure outcome rates, first to begin with the patient selection. If the patient selection is good, and still if the uh, seizures have recurred, then definitely we need to look Ravine. into the uh, you know, the disconnection aspects where we I'm analyzed our uh, series of cases at AIMS, and we found out that the temporal stem was one of the critical uh, site. And this is uh, this holds good for any other techniques. For example, perisylvian technique, the frontobasal disconnection was one of the, I know the at least uh, point for remnant uh, connections. So if the patient selection is good, I guess definitely one should look into the uh, disconnection uh, uh, parts of it and see if there's any remnant disconnection. And the DTI imaging is very useful nah, in yeah, such cases yeah, where yeah. even the uh, uh, Dr. Sanjeev, your, I mean, if you can mute the uh, microphone, that will be helpful. Thank you. So, temporal stem is the, uh, um, in our series with vertical hemispherotomy, temporal stem was the, uh, the site of uh, remnant connections. And when we went back and did, they, we achieved close to 95% of uh, seizure freedom rate. This is, this is uh, very good as compared to any other techniques in epilepsy surgery. So com coming to the enhancing, the aspect of enhancing the functional outcome. So we analyzed our cases with the uh, preoperative fMRIs, right, which is very, very useful. I guess when a patient with hemispheric epilepsy do present to a clinician, one would always think, by doing a hemispherotomy, are they going to be permanently you know, hemiplegic? So that is not the case if the age of, age of onset of weakness is before seven years or to max when the literature is around 10 years. So not more than that. And more than that, the plasticity rates are going to be variable. And of course, here is a, uh, in, in this study, we analyzed the left hemispherotomy, supposedly a dominant uh, left hemisphere, uh, which undergoes you know, perina perinatal uh, ischemic infarcts and becomes gliotic and goes into uh, goes on to develop drug refractory epilepsy. Even in those uh, children, we have seen that the right hemisphere, entire right hemisphere, taking up the function of the speech and um, you know the motor functions. So the right hemisphere compensates for the loss and they remain functionally intact. So we analyze the age cutoff for this plasticity to happen and we could arrive at the number of around seven to eight years. So any children with, with who acquire these deficits before seven, seven years of age, the right hemisphere would definitely take up the uh, functions and they go on to uh, lead a normal life. They will be ambulant, but the remnant deficits are always seen in the hand. Hand is something which doesn't recover with, with uh, irrespective of the what rehabilitation procedure have been taken taken care of. So the uh, and within whether to use fMRI or not, whether to go ahead with just the clinical um, you know picture at presentation because many would say that yes, if the onset of weakness is pretty early, then one can actually proceed with without the these kind of functional imaging. But then many papers, including one by Arthur Kuke, where the largest series of hemispherotomies that even they reported. In spite of developing the weakness at around four to five years of age, those children did develop a significant deficit following hemispherotomy and they did develop residual weakness. 
so the plasticity is very much variable so i guess if fmri is possible if the child is cooperative i guess more than uh, four years or five years they will be cooperative enough to do a functional imaging and the highlight is that even if an adult presents with a hemispheric epilepsy one can definitely uh, go ahead with hemispherotomy if the one age of onset of weakness is below 7 years and if the fmri shows the transfer of function is already taking place to the right hemisphere so that that would be the uh, take home message i would uh, say so definitely uh, the if you can see this, this is one of the uh, adults that we followed up and she had uh, undergone hemispherotomy at the age of 21 years the age of onset of weakness in her was around 2 years and following them and you can see in the mri that there is absolutely no uh, hemisphere existing it was totally gliotic and hemisphrotomy was very a uh, very simple technique with disconnection of few um, cortical mantle to the uh, the central core of brain so once we disconnected she was she became seizure free and on follow up she when she became uh, you know she was free of drugs as well so reasonably good functional outcome with just single uh, functional hemisphere so i guess uh, we sh- we can give them a good functional outcome and seizure freedom rate so that's the take home message thank you all for the kind attention uh, nice presentation dr shabri uh, anyone has any questions Dr. Shabri, do you consider this as a palliative uh, procedure, or uh, is there any other alternative where you can further localize and uh, you know do any uh, you know radio frequency ablation in yeah. certain areas where the seizure is coming from? Even though the whole hemisphere is involved, but you can have areas where specifically you can have discharges coming from. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a great question. I mean, this is sort of a bargain that we always do. and uh, what we actually look for in a video eg is that are there any discharges with anterior pole and the posterior pole? for example if the frontal lobe is involved and the occipital lobe and definitely those kind of um, you know the functional sparing hemispherotomies are possible definitely but then seizure freedom rate is always questionable when we do try to save the hemisphere for example the hemoglobin encephaly rasputin encephalitis and all those uh, children definitely the whole of uh, hemisphere will be usually involved so it depends on the pathology if it's a cortical dysplasia limited to one particular lobe or you know which where we can spare the sensory motor cortex maybe yes definitely as you said we can give them um, you know we, we will try to save uh, the the uh, eloquent cortex as much as possible yeah Yes, madam. Um, just a point to note. Um, sorry, pediatric neurologist here. And well, for, for us as a physician, as a non-surgeon, the main important point for us here was that we were unable to localize. It was more than two, two, him, two, two lobes, isn't it? I mean, two parts. It was not just one hemisphere agreed, but more than two lobes. But the point to make here is at presentation when we were considering surgery for a drug refractory child, this child had no verbal output. had no expressive speech the receptive speech was also very very absolutely nothing there two weeks after surgery when we saw this child for the first time he was actually having receptive speech he has already started showing improvement with regards to developmental milestones so the whole purpose of going into this was because this was a young child to try and prevent mental retardation for inflicting such a major surgery on this child that was the point and the parents were very convinced of that and they've themselves said that you know he's picking up cues so we are showing the de- uh, deficit we have inflicted which is a motorical defect which is a hemiparesis and the hemiparesis we are you know getting back and we will never get it back to perfection but a dorsiflexion in the in the hand probably seems like a decent trade off for us from the background as ch- people taking care of children in that he might be able to lead a somewhat normal life because he's beginning to pick up language and language and intelligence being so 
Shabri, would you agree with that? Yes, I absolutely. I totally agree. I guess the uh, we are trying to look at uh, saving the other hemisphere as yeah. soon as yeah. possible. When the entire hemisphere is uh, involved by the pathology, uh, definitely, I think this is more to do with the patient selection. If the candidate is for hemispherotomy, then nothing should stop us from you know venturing into it. That that was the whole idea of today's presentation. That we should not take a step back and say, okay, let's you know save and see. I mean, there are n number of literature I can quote that anything less than hemispherotomy in cases like these will uh, fail and uh, they will come back with recurrence. And we are going to lose that important, uh, you know, crucial time period where the child is developing the very important milestones. So I guess once the candidate is, is the right candidate for hemispherotomy, we can definitely go ahead and do it, I guess, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Anita, yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Shabri, yeah, very hello. nice case, hi. Thank you. From the pathologist perspective, um, like you showed in this particular case, I think the pathology didn't show uh, the lesional tissue. So in most of these disconnection surgeries, particularly hemispherotomies, just a gentle request that when you submit tissues, make sure it's lesional. And yes, if you're not right. hitting the lesional tissue, I think yeah. it's equally important to tell us that this is non-lesional. Otherwise, yeah. we keep uh, digging, 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 hoping to find some. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to uh, touch upon that point. We expose the cortex. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very limited exposure, middle third of the um, cortex, and mostly it is superior frontal gyrus. So, looking at the MRI, actually, we thought we would, you know, we are hitting the lesion. And at that point of time, a frozen section for such cases, at least at our center, we, we, have, uh, we have failed. So, and then we, we were doubly sure that we, this is dysplastic. Uh, but then, yeah, it was actually a gliotic uh, tissue. Yes, maybe we, we, are, we, are, we will be sending more samples next time, I guess, yeah. Thank you for the feedback. And the yes, don't do a frozen section. No center can give you a diagnosis. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. Please, yeah. please be frozen. Thank, Thank you. you. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll uh, proceed on to the last presentation uh, of today's uh, webinar. Uh, I'll now request Dr. Sharath uh, to introduce the speaker, the presenter. Yeah. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce my colleague, Dr. Uh, Major Savit Kumar. He's a consultant intervention neuroradiologist at Apollo Hospitals, Bangalore. He completed his MBBS from Kim's Bangalore and joined uh, Indian Armed Forces for Short Service Commission, following which he did his MD radiology from INHS Ashwini, Mumbai, and DM from Chitra, Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute of Medical Science and Technology, Trivandrum. He has many publications and contributions to the textbook uh, chapters. Today, he's presenting, uh, showing us a few cases of craniospinal dural AVF, which we all know is an elusive disorder and often mimic many other conditions, both clinically as well as radiologically. So I request Dr. Savik to share his screen and show us a few interesting cases and leave us uh, some take-home messages from here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, good evening all. Yeah, please proceed. Yeah, uh, is my screen seen? Yeah, it's visible. You yeah. can continue. Yeah. So good evening all. So today I'll be showing a few cases of uh, uh, dural arteriovenous fistula, both uh, intracranial and spinal. Uh, so uh, I've uh, acknowledgements to the Dr. Sharath and Dr. Satarana from whom I've collected a few of the cases. So uh, coming to the first case, a 40-year-old male, a chronic smoker and alcoholic, uh, presented with complaints of recurrent headaches since nine years with visual disturbance. I'll show the series of uh, MRs over the period. And then uh, 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 memory impairment, which was uh, the duration of onset was one month. There was no focal neurological deficit. So this is at the initial presentation, 2012. The no uh, parenchymal changes or white matter changes in the uh, on diffusion or flare, neither on T2, but we see a few flow voids, which is seen in the region of the uh, left anterior or middle cranial fossa. Nothing was done. So this is 2014 again. 
uh, a subtle uh, two white matter hyperintensities focal uh, seen in the right frontal lobe, uh, whereas the rest of the brain parenchyma appears normal. The flowards again noted, they appear a little bigger now. Now, this is a time when he presented with the memory impairment. Now, here we see more uh, uh, few discrete and confluent white matter hyperintensities, which is also showing uh, diffusion changes, which is predominantly involving the region of the cingulate gyrus, the corpus callosum, and the periventricular region. Um, there is no uh, hemorrhage or bleed within the brain parenchyma. On uh, MR angiogram, we see a few cluster of vessels which is seen uh, uh, in the middle cranial force on the left side. Now, uh, angiogram. So, on an angiogram, what we see is uh, uh, this is an uh, angiogram from the left uh, external carotid artery. These are the external carotid artery branches, the middle meningeal artery, the accessory meningeal artery, which is forming a fistulous communication along the uh, left convexity, with pro, uh, which is draining directly into the cortical veins. The cortical veins are in turn refluxing to the superior sagittal sinus. Uh, uh, this is a vein of labia which is refluxing to the uh, transverse sinus, the sigmoid, the and the jugular. So uh, what we have is a dural arteriovenous fistula which is a fistulous communication between the dural branches of the external carotid artery with the, uh, directly with the cortical uh, vein. With reflux uh, to the cortical veins, the superior sagittal sinus, the, uh, also the uh, reflux is also seen to the uh, straight sinus and the deep system. The, this is just to illustrate the uh, uh, draining vein, the fistulous, uh, the fistulous point, there's a fistulous point and the feeding artery, no? post embolization. So post embolization, at two weeks clinical follow-up, patient had a significant improvement in his cognitive function. So uh, 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 the, uh, these white matter changes, which he developed progressively over a period of time, uh, is mainly because of the venous congestion happening due to the arterialization of the flow in the uh, draining veins of the brain. A second case, so 50 year old male, uh, with history of uh, uh, CVT three years ago and uh, was on anticoagulants, presented with a worsening headache for the past one year. Later, there was progressive memory impairment and uh, uh, memory uh, uh, rigidity in all limbs, and uh, he would not follow any commands. He was unable to speak or and swallowing was uh, difficult. It's just a, a video showing the patient prior to the uh, intervention. He does not obey any commands. So this is the MRI. Now, uh, what we see is a uh, uh, hyperintensity which is seen involving in the brain stem, the, predominantly the pons, which is seen hyperintense on diffusion, flare, and T2. There's also hyperintensity which is seen predominantly in the left uh, cerebral hemisphere, involving the subcortical and periventricular white matter. Uh, uh, white matter hyperintensity also seen in the right cerebral hemisphere, predominantly in the periventricular uh, region. So these changes are seen on diffusion, flare, mm -hmm. and on T2-weighted images. When we uh, look at the SWI images, we see very prominent transmedullary veins seen in bilateral cerebral hemispheres, slightly uh, more prominent on the left as compared to the right side. Uh, similar prominent veins are also seen in the posterior fossa. Now, if we look at the venogram, the flow signal of the superior sagittal sinus is not well visualized. Very prominent transmedullary veins are seen on the uh, venogram. So this is the uh, angiographic images. So this is a left external carotid artery angiogram showing the uh, uh, showing the. Uh, So this is the fistulous point, which is fed by the uh, dural branch of the external carotid artery, the, the occipital and the uh, middle meningeal with reflux into the transverse sinus, 
sigmoid sinus and the torcular and the suprasagittal sinus. Now, if you see, there is also a reflex into the uh, through the vein of labe to the uh, superficial cortical veins, and then in turn reflexing into the suprasagittal sinus. So this is. This is a vertebral artery angiogram. Supply also from the uh, uh, post meningeal branch of the vertebral artery seen. Uh, so again, a case of dural artery venous fistula. So if you look at the intercarotid artery angiograms, there is significant slowing of the circulation time. And the superior sagittal sinus is not involved in the drainage of the brain, but instead the brain is draining through transmedullary veins and down to the pterygoid plexus and then into the deep system with significant slowing of the circulation time. So uh, embolization, so transembolization through the yeah, uh, external carotid artery feed is done. So this is a squid cast uh, showing, uh, 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 showing the uh, occlusion of the uh, fistula and the draining vein and the uh, proximal feeding artery. No, no. So post embolization angiogram, complete exclusion of the fistula. The external character angiogram now does not show any uh, ref uh, uh, reflux into the intracranial cortical veins and venous sinuses. So this is the MRI eight weeks post treatment. There is complete near complete reversal of diffusion changes, complete reversal of the diffusion changes and near complete reversal of the changes on flare. And uh, uh, it's a near complete diffusion, uh, near normal appearing uh, diffusion weighted images, both in the supratentorial and the infratentorial brain. Uh, brain. When you look at the uh, SWA again, there is significant reduction in the prominent transmedullary veins, which are seen in both cerebral hemispheres. And this is a clinical follow-up with near complete recovery. My parent okay. So again, the previous case illustrating the significant response on uh, 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 the congestive features in the brain, secondary to treatment of the fistula. Another case illustration this is a 68 year old male who presented with cerebellar signs and ataxia. So uh, on flare, we see white matter lesion, which is uh, uh, predominantly involving the cerebellum on the uh, right side and the vermis. There is mass effect, which is seen in the form of effacement of the uh, foley and partial effacement of the uh, ventricle. This is the SWI images. Few microbleeds and flow voids are seen within the lesion and around the lesion. And uh, this is a post contrast image. We see patchy enhancement predominantly along the periphery of the lesion with prominent flow voids along the periphery of the lesion. Now, this, this was presumed to be a, a, a space occupying lesion, and patient was taken up for a biopsy, which was inconclusive. The, uh, the uh, finding which which suggested that this is uh, not a space occupied lesion on a review of the images were the presence of this prominent flow voids both on the post-contrast images and on the SWI. The, so the angiogram was done. So, so this is a, a angiogram through a microcatheter placed in the posterior meningeal branch, the posterior meningeal branch of the vertebral artery, showing the presence of the fistula in the posterior cranial fossa. So this is a feeding artery. This is the fistulous point and this is a draining vein. So this is the draining vein. So again, a case of dural artery fistula, this is post embolization showing complete exclusion of the fistula. Case four, an elderly male who presented with uh, slow response, slow speech, disorientation and poor uh, short term memory. Now, if you look at the MRI, these are SWI images showing uh, superficial hemosidrosis in the posterior canal fossa 
predominantly along the cerebellar foliae. And also we see microbleeds uh, and uh, uh, focal hemocytin staining in bilateral thalami. And also similar microbleeds are seen in the uh, uh, cerebellum. And also what we see is multiple bright uh, 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 areas which, which are uh, uh, vessels which are seen within the, in the postcranial fossa. Now, when we, uh, when we look at the uh, 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 MR venogram images, we see multiple cluster of vessels which are seen in the posterior cranial fossa, again suggesting a vascular malformation or a dural arteriovenous fistula. Now, here the patient's presentation is like a thalamic dementia. So, this is the angiogram. So, this is the uh, external catheter artery angiogram showing the fistulous point between the external carotid artery and the uh, 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 intracranial uh, vessels, so intracranial veins. So this is a, a occipital branch, transoccipital. This is a middle meningeal branch. Uh, this is a fistulous point, and then in turn draining into the posterior carotid fossa cortical veins, and then reflexing uh, into the uh, 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 intercerebral vein, vein of Gallen, and uh, opacification of the uh, reflex into the straight sinus. So here, the uh, fistula is along the uh, uh, convexity fed by the external carotid artery branch with the predominant venous drainage into the posterior carotid fossa veins. This is post embolization showing the squid cast. So uh, uh, the patient had a significant recovery of symptoms post uh, uh, embolization. Case 5, a 69-year-old male who presented with a history of progressive weakness of the lower limbs for six months numbness in bilateral lower limbs uh, since uh, uh, since three months. He had also bowel and bladder symptoms. So uh, T2 weighted images of the uh, spine shows longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis with this T2 hyperintensity with cord swelling seen extending, involving the lower dorsal, uh, uh, involving the dorsal uh, spinal cord, uh, dorsal cord and the conus medullaris with multiple flow voids. Now, on contrast administration, there's intense enhancement which is seen within the conus medullaris. Again, an angiogram shows there's a dural arteriovenous fistula with two feeders, one present at L1 level and other one present at D2 level. So both feeders were selectively embolized and selectively cannulated and embolized. So this is a post-embolization angiogram of each feeder showing complete exclusion of the fistula. So this is a six-month follow-up MRI shows complete resolution of T2 hyperintensity involving the spinal cord and disappearance of all the prominent flow voids seen on uh, MRI. So to conclude, uh, dementia is one of the rarer clinical presentation of uh, intracranial DAVFs. It could be cortical or thalamic, which is determined by what is the predominant uh, venous drainage. Uh, uh, if the uh, uh, fistulous drainage is uh, reflexing into the cortical veins, the superficial or the deep cortical veins, they tend to present with cortical dementia, whereas if the reflex is to the deep uh, system, that is a vein of gallon or intercerebral veins, then, then there is thalamic congestion and these patients present with thalamic dementia. These cases typically present with white matter changes on imaging, which could uh, which would be the periventricular or uh, subcortical white matter and cortical dementia, or in the deep gray matter as in thalamic dementia. These changes are secondary to venous hypertension. This venous hypertension is caused by fistulous communication between the artery and vein and arterialization of the, arterialization of the vein. And patients, uh, when persistent or untreated, may also uh, progress to develop hydrocephalus, which is again because of the impaired CSF absorption due to arterialization of these veins. So these white matter lesions, uh, either in the brain or spi spinal, spinal cord, in a uh, intracranial or spinal DAVS can show enhancement. That is because of the disruption of the blood brain or blood spinal cord barrier, which could easily mimic a tumor if, uh, uh, if DAVF is not suspected. So always have a low threshold to diagnose a DAVF, uh, 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 especially when you see flow voids in an abnormal location in the intracranial or uh, in the spinal cord, because these are uh, a, a completely reversible conditions if treated on time. And also a wrong diagnosis of a spinal uh, transverse myelitis, uh, a longitudinal extensive transverse, transverse myelitis as a demyelinating condition, which uh, generally tend to be treated with steroids or uh, been uh, as a part of workup, a lumbar puncture is done, will cause a significant progression of symptoms in patients with uh, spinal DAVF. 
So uh, having a low threshold, pick, uh, picking up the subtle finding of flow voids in the spinal cord or sp uh, brain is very important to uh, pick these conditions and treat early as these are completely reversible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Savit. Any questions? Uh, Sharad uh, and uh, Savit, uh, most of the things were picked up on SWI. So I think uh, how much is the significance of, because some of the images come without SWI. So I think, uh, you know, it may be missed if it is, the, all the sequence are not done. So how significant yeah. is the SWI images uh, I mean, uh, uh, sequence in this? Uh, sir, uh, uh, in any brain imaging, the three important sequences which should always be done uh, uh, is diffusion, flare, and SWI. Because these are very much important to pick up in any of your conditions if the if you have to limit your sequences. Now, coming to dural arteriovenous fistula, uh, uh, there are few sequences which will help you to make the diagnosis on MR imaging with near 100% confidence. That is, one is an SWI and second is an uh, 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 arterial spin labeling, that is an ASL sequence. Now, these sequences can pick up the presence of a fistula and the arterialization of the vein based on the signal intensity or the uh, color pattern on the images. So, SWI and ASL, SWI is definitely an integral part of any brain imaging and SWI and ASL can help pick up a, du a dural arterial fistula of the brain uh, with near 100% of confidence. And even in spine, if you are seeing a LETM, better to get a, a heavily titivated images like CIS3D, which are very, very sensitive in picking up the subtle flow voids which are on the surface of the card. So SWI, even if you are doing a screening because of limitations, please request to do a SWI sequence in the brain and a typical elderly male with a progressive paraparesis, all those cases better to involve, uh, get a heavily titivated images in the spine so that most of the lesions are picked up uh, at the appropriate time and uh, treatment can be initiated. Once the bladder and bowel gets involved in a spinal dural AVF, probably the treatment effect and the cure rate is very, very less. So that's the message. Have a low threshold. Ask for DSA if there is any subtle uh, suspicion so that this can be treated as early as possible. Right. Uh, in the spine, spinal DAVF, especially the uh, reversal of the symptoms post treatment is always not complete. Means uh, uh, the motor symptoms are the ones which tend to reverse to the maximum, whereas the bowel and bladder symptoms may not reverse at all. And the uh, sensory symptom reverse to a lesser extent. So timing of treatment is very important because if we pick up the uh, condition very early and treat him, we may be able to reverse all his symptoms. But uh, if we treat him late, we may reach a stage where reversal is only partial. Good. Thank you. So if there are no questions now, I would not like to conclude uh, the session. So I would have to request uh, uh, Dr. Anita and Dr. Shuram Krishna to make their uh, remarks, concluding remarks. I think fantastic session, great cases that were presented, a lot of learning. I think it's a fantastic start and let's hope every webinar has more and more attendees. I noticed that I think we started with almost 30, 38 and the numbers I think remained almost the same till the end. So went up job. to 42, went up to 42. It did? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was a nice, ses nice session. We had very interesting cases and good discussion. We hope we will continue with the same spirit in the coming months. I request all the members from the different places also to contribute and make the series interesting and fruitful. So thank you all. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers from uh, uh, Nimans, from St. John's, uh, Ramaya Middle College, uh, and Apollo Hospitals, both uh, the presenters and uh, the mentors uh, for uh, presenting the interesting cases. But as I said, it was very interesting, all, all different aspects of neurology and neurosurgery and uh, neuroradiology. Uh, before concluding, I want to uh, thank uh, Alchem Laboratories for providing uh, this platform, uh, Zoom platform, uh, which they have provided for the entire year for the academic activities. Uh, 
I would like to thank uh, Lauren uh, Farmer for uh, supporting us for this uh, today's academic uh, session. Uh, uh, we have a, a calendar ready for next one year. So next uh, uh, month, August, uh, Mysore and Hassan team will uh, present their cases. So we have adequate time uh, to group together and uh, present. So we want uh, everyone, every specialty like neurology, neurosurgery and allied senses to present cases as much as possible and increase youngsters to present. That's the motto. Uh, so thank you once again, everyone. Uh, good night.